Welcome to the Broncos Podcast with Troy Rink. I am your host, Troy Rink, from the Denver Post. It is Friday of game week. It is Broncos v. Seahawks. Here we go. We've been waiting. We've been talking hypothetically about all these scenarios, and now it gets real, folks. Broncos open the season in Seattle. I know it brings back memories of 2022 and the clown show that was Nathaniel Hackett, and I don't even blame Russell Wilson on that. I blame that game on Hackett. That was an interesting game. I don't want to say it was a great game. Broncos probably should have won. This is a winnable game, but can they win? There's some history with Bo Nix, rookie quarterbacks in the NFL, and in Seattle specifically that unfortunately create pause for me. And also, there is a way to win this game. There is a clear path to win this game. So it's all going to get started on Sunday. I will be there at Lumen Field. Keeping you guys posted on social media, writing columns for the Denver Post. But today, we talk about it, and I'm going to get the insight from my man, Darren McKee, DMAC. I love having Darren on. We've known each other forever. So we are going to talk about this opener, preview it. Can the Broncos pull off the upset and avoid getting seasick in Seattle? We'll have all of it after the break. Have you been injured in a car wreck or hurt at work? What are you waiting for? Give my friends at Hoggett Injury Law a call. Their motto, with us, it's personal. That's because it is. Listen, I've known Derby Hoggett forever. We traveled the country watching our boys play baseball. We became good friends. Many of his clients become Darby's good friend. You don't even have to pay Darby up front. If your case goes as planned, Darby will be the one writing checks to you. So, again, if you've been hurt in a car wreck or injured at work, give Darby's team a call. It's one 833 H O double G A T T. That's one eight three three Hoggett, or visit the website at hoggettlaw.com. Welcome back to the Broncos podcast with Troy Rink. I am your host, Troy Rink, from the Denver Post. So let's get right into it. A football meat sandwich. Why don't I think the Broncos are going to win? Feels like I'm the one who's trying to give the honest take, not the easy take here. Listen, it's a better story if the Broncos have a great season. I've covered the last 10 years, the last seven losing seasons, last eight, no playoffs. This this team, I believe, will surprise people. I just don't. So here's, here's the way I put it. I like this Broncos team. I don't like them in this matchup. It's because of where they're playing. Seattle, I've seen Broncos teams lose in Seattle. I saw Peyton Manning lose in Seattle. I saw Russell Wilson lose in Seattle. Then the Brian Greasy quarterback game in 02 that they won, I wasn't covering it then. I was on the baseball beat. So let's just paint the picture with numbers on why I'm a little pessimistic and why it may take a slight miracle. Not Al Michaels in Lake Placid. Not that kind of miracle. But it's going to take a miracle. A lot of people are taking the Seahawks in their survivor pools. So that should let you know that the Broncos – don't have a great chance in this game. But why? Why, Troy, are you saying they don't? It's the numbers against the rookie quarterbacks. Folks, they're frightening. They are absolutely frightening on how bad rookie quarterbacks are at Lumen Field and in general in the NFL. So I want to go over a few numbers with you to let you know why it's going to be difficult. So you're not thinking this is just opinion. This is an educated opinion. And I wrote this column in the Denver Boats talking about stats versus trust. For a young quarterback to be trusted, you have to have that cognitive ability, the slow heartbeat. All these things that Broncos players tell me Bo Nix absolutely has. Luke Wattenberg, the center, told me the other day, there's no panic. There's no panic in this guy. Like, he gets it. That's a great trait because when you look at your lineman and you look at your fellow players in a huddle, and 75,000 people are screaming, the alarms are blaring, can you play with a slow heartbeat? They believe Bo Nix can't. And the fact he played in SEC stadiums and in the Pac-12 at Washington, at Husky Stadium, that helps. It's not the NFL. And here's why I bring that up. Nix is becoming the first Broncos rookie to start at Cop- uh, an opener since John Elway in 83. Elway, folks, completed one pass in a win. He got benched. He went one for eight. That's not going to happen to Knicks, so don't worry about that. But I'm saying this to have context and prepare yourself. Maybe replace that game day gum with some Tums. And don't make every pass a referendum on his career. It's one game at Seattle. But here's the issue. 
rookie quarterbacks since Lumen Field opened in 2002, and I did the research, 4 and 14. Victims include Jared Goff, Carson Wentz, Deshaun Watson, and Trevor Lawrence. Again, the stadium, it's not loud. It's a Led Zeppelin concert. It's hard to hear yourself think there. And their defenses are typically good, whether it's Pete Carroll and now with Mike McDonald. I've never been in an environment like Russell Wilson in 2022. That was part Premier Soccer League and Dante's Inferno when it comes to decibels and vitriol. Never seen anything like that in the NFL. It won't be like that. It won't be. But what it will be is difficult because of this stat. And this is even more sobering. And I can, I'll can i mention this to DMAC because we're going to bring him on here shortly. NFL quarterbacks are 0 Seven and one rookies in week one over the excuse me over the last five years. The last rookie quarterback to win a week one start, Sam Darnold in 2018, Jets versus Lions. Quarterbacks since 2018, rookie quarterbacks starting week one since 2018, 0 7 and one. Since the NFL merger, because you're like, Troy, small sample size. We had a bunch of terrible quarterbacks. I hear what you're saying. Since the merger, rookie quarterbacks starting week one, 16, 35, and one. So if you're betting on the Rockies to win, excuse me, the Broncos to win, you're essentially betting on the 2024 Rockies in terms of winning percentage. Would you bet on the Rockies? Would you? Really? I doubt it. So that's where the trouble starts for me. Doesn't mean they can't pull off the upset. It doesn't. It's just History matters to me as someone who covered baseball for basically 15, 18 years every day. You can't disregard history. And this is not only a history locally at Lumen Field, but overall. And so if Knicks wins, folks, you have something. But I do think two things can be true. He can play well enough to show us that the moment's not too big and they still lose. Not a look Lamar Jackson last night. I'm not comparing him to Lamar Jackson. Jackson was terrific. He missed on a couple throws late. He played well enough to give you hope. He could win another MVP. But that's what I'm saying. There's an avenue for Knicks to show us the moment's not too big and for the Broncos not to win. And it doesn't help that he's facing Mike McDonald. And that gets into my second point quickly before I bring on my man DMAC. The avenue to win for the Broncos is very simple. If you want to have fans sit on their hands, Use your legs. Run the damn ball. That's what you're built to do. It's why you paid Ben Powers, Mike McGlinchey, and Quinn Miners to run the damn football. And if Javante Williams can be the guy he was his rookie year, he can get back to 4.2, 4.3 yards of carry, you have a chance. But you have to think in terms of 125, 130 yards on the ground because that shortens the game. It takes the crowd out of it, and it takes some pressure off of Bo Nix. You want a rookie to struggle, a quarterback, be third and six and up or third and eight. No chance. And I say that because Mike McDonald, the new Seahawks coach, is known for his blitz packages and odd man fronts. But if you want to win this game, you got to run the football. And you can't run from that truth, folks. That is going to be the secret. Bo Nix throwing 45 times is not the recipe. And the last quarterback to win, rookie quarterback to win at Lumen Field, Brock Purdy. San Francisco, two years ago. Very similar college resume to Bo Nix, four-year starter at Iowa State. He played his butt off, but he threw for about 220 yards, no turnovers, and that was the key, and they ran the football well. But the problem is nobody's going to confuse the Broncos with the 49ers. They're not that team. But that is the avenue to success. Can they do it? I have my doubts, but I'm going to find out what DMAC thinks. I want to get to my man, Darren McKee. You can hear him every day on PhD from noon to three with Scott Hastings, Tyler Columbus, and DMAC. They are fantastic. Uh, They are uh, always a recommended listen. So I want to have a quick break and bring in my man, DMAC, right after the break. Well, it's never a bad time to enhance your home. Maybe you want it to just be more comfortable. Glass doors can add a nice touch. That's where Jamie Haig comes in. He and his wife, Lisa, run RBJ Glass. They pride themselves on customer service, honesty, and integrity. We have a new sliding glass door in our house. We absolutely love it. It's fantastic. They do this crazy work. They do European shower enclosures, standard shower glass, mirrors, window and glass replacement, 
insulated doggy doors with the winter coming up, office cubicles, and small commercial storefronts. They have competitive prices and offer discounts to veterans, senior citizens, and have even accommodated single parents. So what are you waiting for? Give Jamie a call. It's RBJ Glass, 720 883 3144. 720 883 3144. Or email Jamie at rbjglass2017 at gmail.com. Well, now, let's not wait any further. There he is, my man, Darren McKee, DMAC. I love having DMAC on the pod. I've been on his pod. It's, it's, a, it's not just a friendship thing. I love our banter. We can agree to disagree. We have fun with it. Again, listen to Darren on PhD on Altitude 92.5 every day from noon to three. Fantastic program. DMAC, how the hell are you? I'm doing great. Um, just a, a note: I didn't think they could do it, but the Rockies struck out 16 times in a 16 times in one game in back-to-back games. I, I just want to throw that in before we talk about the Broncos. That Rockies are all they they did win one of those games, but I mean, they struck out Troy 16 times in back-to-back games, and I I applaud them. I I I didn't think that would get done. Yeah, their their level of incompetence at times is stunning. It's stunning. <laughs> That being said, I know I'm here to talk about the Broncos. Yeah, I loved your article. I read it this morning. It's um, the, the, I did not know those sobering uh, numbers for uh, rookies uh, there at Lumen Field or you know whatever they call it these days. Uh, yeah, that's daunting, daunting. Um, but I do think uh, Bo Nix is the is the Bobot. He's like a robot quarterback, the Bobot, and uh, me, you know, Sean has called a play, beep, uh, throw it here, beep, processing information. And perhaps you're right. Like Brock Purdy is kind of that same thing. You don't have to be flashy. You don't have to do too much. And I, I love his composure. Um, the fact that he is that Bobot, there's not a lot of emotion going on there. I like it. I think it's good. I think it's a positive. I, I, think, I think he would have as good of a chance as any rookie quarterback uh, to succeed there in Seattle. And on that point, I would agree for two reasons. One, Seattle, new coach. They're, they're in transition, too. I mean, I, I, th- I believe they still have playoff expectations, but a new coach, first game, never been a head coach, Mike McDonald, even though he uses these creative defenses, you just he doesn't have the same personnel he did in Baltimore. Baltimore led the league in takeaways last year, uh, but he doesn't have that personnel. They're leaning heavily on this rookie, Byron Murphy from Texas. But mm-hmm. in regards to Knicks, where I agree with you is it's the fit with Sean Payton. And you talk about this a lot in your quarterback manifesto as part of that. But fit matters. Where you're drafted matters. Most quarterbacks are not capable of overcoming dysfunction, DMAC, whether it's with the coach, GM, scheme. In this case, we have a coach who clearly wanted a specific guy Mm -hmm. to fit his scheme. Now, of course, they would have taken Caleb Williams or Jaden Daniels, certainly Caleb Williams. But they have a guy they believe can run their scheme. Yeah. And you use the word Bobot. I say Bo the Builder. Uh, okay. he, he is the guy that looks like that can make the pieces of this puzzle fit. Good. I just don't like it this weekend against a really good secondary, two great cornerbacks. The noise, I, I for me, and I'll, I'll see what you think. The the only chance for an upset is the ability to run the football, mm. and that's how I see this game possibly turning on its head. And see, if the Ravens were not good stopping the run, and Seattle. As bad as Denver was against the run, Seattle was right there with them last year. Actually, the last two years. So there's an opening to success, and that's what this team's built on: is to run the football, to set up bootlegs, set up play action, to set up those deep strikes. And that's where I see the path. But do you believe in Javante Williams, Dmac? Do you believe in Jaleel McLaughlin? Do you believe in Estime in, a, in his first game ever to pull off that kind of upset? Well, Troy, do you believe in life after love? <laughs> I I think that, you know, the running game will be good enough. Listen, I got the Seahawks winning too. I don't want to be a downer here with you, but I got them winning something like 23 to 20, something along those lines. I mean, this is a lot to expect, but it's not just first time um, head coach. It's the first time offensive uh, coordinator for, for the Seahawks as well. Grub, who used to be a pig farmer or something back in the day, way back in the day. So it's brand new in Seattle. So to sit here and pretend that we know exactly how this is going to go is is difficult. 
to think that Bo Nix hasn't played in front of hostile crowds before. He has, and he's done so in Seattle. Different stadium, of course, against the Huskies. But, hey, man, loud is loud. You know, he gets it. He knows it. He's been under pressure before. So, again, I think he's got as good of a chance as anybody. But it's a lot to expect. Can they run the ball? We'll see. You know, they have a high-paid offensive line. Captain Quinn Miners, not Captain Bowles or Captain McGlinchey, by the way. Captain Quinn Miners. I, I think they'll they'll put Bo in a position that will benefit him the most, and you just sort of take it from there. I, you know what? I feel a little bit more anxiety or anxiousness with the Broncos' defense rather than the Broncos' offense. Um, I think I know what we're going to get out of the offense, and I I doubt I had a lot of um, the sky is falling people. What if the Broncos are one in five with Bo Nix? How are the fans going to feel? It's like, well, all right. We want to go all doom and gloom right off the bat. We, we can do that if you want. But I don't think there's any pressure on Bo Nix. It, it, as much as there's always pressure in the NFL, okay? I get it. There's always pressure. But he's not going anywhere. Sean Payton's not going anywhere. George Payton's not going anywhere. Stability is what the Broncos have on their foundation over there at Broncos Park at Common Spirit with the bulldozers and earth movers. The most stabilizing force is Greg Penner, Troy. And yeah. finally, not only does Sean Payton have his team, but Greg Penner with a year under his belt, he now knows what it takes to um, stabilize an NFL franchise. I do think he is a quick learner and has done the right thing. Yeah, I mean, that that is one thing when you look at the carousel of chaos and the clown car they've been riding in the last seven, eight years. It's It goes back to 13 starting quarterbacks prior to Knicks five head coaches in nine years, what offensive coordinators during that span. I mean, you just can't win with that kind of turnover. It's proven because you'd have to be so talented to overcome that. You could do right. it in college and try to turn a roster over it kind of like Dion does, even though he hasn't won yet. You can't do it in the NFL. I have one quick more question about Knicks, and then we'll move on to that defense. One of the problems when they were looking at Knicks, for me, problems the wrong word, concern, I couldn't unsee some of his Auburn games. I watch a lot of SEC football, okay. and everyone brings up, oh, he beat Oregon in his first game. I was watching. They forget to mention he was like 10 for 32 in that game. Hmm. Seth Williams, the former Bronco, caught that touchdown. But Nix, when he ran into trouble at Auburn, again, five coordinators in five years in college. That's hmm. crazy. But he would try to do too much. I did not see that play at Oregon. Is there any concern from you that in this environment, opener – all of it on the line, you know, family, everyone, that he will try to do too much and lean back into some bad habits that he had that resulted in him leaving Auburn. Well, nobody's perfect, and all young quarterbacks and quarterbacks in general make mistakes, and how are you going to account for a ball that's tipped at the line? Mahomes had that, and he caught his own pass. I mean, <laughs> shizzle happens, right? So the question is, will he press too far and try to make something happen, which essentially – what Zach Wilson has been accused of right. in his past. I don't think so. Um, and I, I think they'll do as much as possible to, again, make sure that he's not put in those situations with what they're calling and how they're processing everything. So I don't, I would be surprised if that were to happen, Troy. Um, we just haven't seen any evidence of it so far in the spring, summer camp, training camp, preseason games. So if it does happen, it's going to come out of nowhere. So I guess in the world of anything can happen, you can't discount it. But the maturity level on Bo Nix, I think, is next level. Hey, man, he's not tripping the light fantastic. He, he's living in a mansion in Castle Pines. Uh, unless a moose is going to stir up a party, he's pretty safe out there. I mean, it's it's he's married. He's settled down. He's... 24 going on AARP. You know, we'll see him down at the senior center playing shuffleboard. This guy is not that type of wild and crazy dude. Jay Cutler, Troy, owned a home in Parker and kept an apartment in Lodo. Yeah. Okay. That, he, was living the life. he was living the life of being the Broncos quarterback. It's yeah. as we see, and we've said this about, I think he played at Auburn with Bo, uh, Bo Jackson and he played at Oregon with Dan Fouts. He's been around forever. We know this. And there's right. no reason to think he's going to panic. I it, I would feel better about his situation if he had more weapons around him. Because, you know, because Sutton, I, I wrote this last Sunday, 
part of Bo Nix's season is going to hinge on Cortland Sutton playing well, but somebody else has to develop. Is that Josh Reynolds? Is that Greg Dulcich? Somebody else has to develop for this kid to give him a fighting chance because on paper, their yeah. weapons aren't great. Now we could look up 10 weeks from now and say, hey, yeah. we totally underestimated, you know, Devon Vele and Jaleel McLaughlin, whatever. Yeah. But yeah. right now on paper, they're a little short. Yeah, it was disheartening to see Xavier Worthy with the Chiefs, wasn't oh, it? Geez. My goodness. I it's mean, that was like, you got to be kidding one. me. But <laughs> that's why, that's why to me, the main target for next year is Travis Hunter. And the, up, the upside of winning six or seven games, that will put you in the Travis Hunter sweepstakes. And I really do hope Garrett Bowles works out because I hope they're in a position where left tackle isn't a big issue. I'm hoping that's the case. So I'm, I'm hoping for an extended stay by Garrett Bowles because, yes, you're right. Who is that dynamic, game-changing guy? And, and you're right. They don't have it. They would love for it to be Marvin Mims, and we just haven't seen a lot of evidence of it. Troy Franklin, I don't know. It feels like this is going to be a redshirt year for him in the pros. 100%. That being said, sometimes you don't get everything at the same time. You do have to build over at least a couple of years. But if you have the quarterback, that's the foundation to build from, not build the rest of the foundation and then put the hot tub time machine right in the middle of the party. No, you 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 do it this way and you can come along together. I got gotcha. you. Who is that guy? It's not Cortland Sutton or he'd be making 30 million a year. Is it uh, Josh Reynolds? I don't know. I doubt it. Vele's pretty nice. He's cool. I don't think any of the running backs are all that dynamic. I mean, maybe you can get some dynamic plays out of Jaleel McLaughlin, but there is nobody special. There's nobody that's just like, whoa. Um, and I think that guy will be Travis Hunter. I'm hoping for the Broncos, but we may have to wait a year. And it sucks that, uh, <laughs> can you believe the Chiefs got Xavier worthy? Seriously, Troy? Like, I mean, none of the other NFL teams could see that. They were just waiting around for the Super Bowl champions to pick him up. I mean, and worse blows me away. And worse, they traded with the Bills to get him. No. So they they executed executed trades with the Bills to get Mahomes and Xavier Worthy, if my memory serves. The good news, though, is that dynamic playmakers um, and incredible athletes do come out of college every single year. Yep. Good, good to go at corner and receiver. It's crazy how good these kids are coming out of school and they're ready for the NFL right away. So even if it's not, uh, that's why it's so such a bummer that in that incredible wide receiver class with CD lamb and Justin Jefferson, we got Jerry Judy, which is a, a downer and watch. He'll be unbelievable with Cleveland. Right. Of course. Yeah. Um, yeah. but they tried, yeah. they, they, they had the right idea sort of in mind. They just got the wrong guy. And then they take KJ Hamler in the next round. You're like, yeah, and that made that made no sense. And, and and I've had all these debates about people defending Elway, like because of the Super Bowls, and I I just kind of roll my eyes at it because the true measure of a GM Troy to me isn't immediately; it's two or three years down the line. That's that's the measure of it. Two or three years down the line from a draft, and quarterback and coach. To me, that's a GM, if the GM has power in the coach. So to think that, oh, Elway just got here and they went to the Super Bowl and got Peyton Manning, it's like, oh, okay. I mean, that did happen. But Jerry Judy and K.J. Hamler with Vic Fangio as your head coach? Huh? What? Why? I mean, you know, passing on Josh Allen as, as Elway self-admittedly was his worst mistake. I kind of, I'm, The reason I'm going here is I'm kind of okay with whatever happens this year because I think fundamentally – the Broncos have done the right thing. So my patience level is expansive. I would agree because I tell people this. When you identify the right coach and right quarterback, when you're rebuilding, even though they don't use that word, that's how you do this. Like yes. Elway, to your point, his first five years as a GM, and A, his last five years an F. Like it was just the oddest dichotomy for a guy who – was a George Steinbrenner go out, recruit the best free agents. And then when it became, we have to build from the draft. It was like, Ooh, yikes. But we'll get, that's a topic for another day. You and I always sure. have fun getting that. Sure. Looking at this game and you brought it up. The concerns on the defense are real. And 
I believe they're going to be better along the defensive line, but this secondary, I'm not going to lie. I, mm. I, there's some issues here that need to be resolved and in front of our eyes. It, you know, They say faith is believing what you haven't seen. Well, you got to have faith that they're going to be good right now because we haven't seen it on the field where Pat Sertan, Riley Moss, Brandon mm. Jones, and P.J. Locke are all together. I mean, Brandon Jones didn't play, right. and he wasn't like he was this – you know, bona fide starter in Miami. So I'm not sure what they have. And Skinner, he's a young guy and he has crazy talent, athleticism, but Mm -hmm. when he's out of position, he's out of position. So what is your, you know, kind of look, let's go secondary first because people don't realize how good Seattle's receiving core is and starting with DK Metcalf and with uh, Lockett. And if I'm Vance Joseph, I let Uh, Pat Sertan if you want him to earn his money you want him to get more picks and I wrote that he needs to get more picks put him on the number one receiver and let him trail him and I would leave Sertan on Metcalf but what are your what do you see when you look at this revamped uh, Broncos secondary do you well it's again a lot of questions and it brings me more anxiety than the quarterback position okay Sertan great okay fine but you know Troy how much percentage wise how much how how often do teams play zone and if you're playing zone, you can't trail guys around. And the reason you play so much zone, Troy, not everybody's Pat Sertan. <laughs> what, what, what choice do you have? And, and so, and you got a million of them out there. And I guess Riley Moss is the starter, right? And but that yeah, is starting for sure. Yeah, that's in pencil, not pen. And we'll see how that goes. That could be a fluid situation throughout the course of the year. They didn't want Justin Simmons back. They didn't yeah. want him back. If they wanted him back, they could have kept him. And we could see financially it would have been relatively cheap to keep him too. So that's a culture shift. Um, but the culture shift may be like, uh, you know, uh, tectonic plates, dude. And we may be sinking into the ocean at, at times. I, I could see a situation where it's like, oh, everything's good. Everything's good. Every, oh, that's a touchdown. You know, uh, everything's good. Everything's, oh, that's not good. I could see a defense that sort of gives up big plays and it it feels like everything's going well. And all of a sudden there's miscommunication and collapses all over the place. And that's got me concerned. That 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 has me much more concerned, Troy, than how Bo Nix is going to do. Yeah. And, and again, Brandon Jones is the X factor for me because P.J. Locke, I think, will play well. He's had injury history, but... Jones, I just don't know. He's a the reason they moved on from Simmons that they won't say out loud. They wanted a more physical safety. They want to play a different style of defense. They did not want just a true ball hawking safety. Mm. They and Jones blitzes. He you know he just he'll light you up like the Vegas Strip. That's his game. But we haven't seen it, and you didn't see a lot of it in Miami. Like I said, they are betting on his potential, and you can guarantee. With Riley Moss, if he if there's fewer than like six targets in the first half against mm. him, I'll be shocked. They are going to go at him. It was just like <laughs> last night in that Ravens Chiefs game. Mm-hmm. The, a backup lineman came in first play. They go at him with a stunt, and a guy gets to the quarterback. Like mm. the NFL is just it's ruthless, ruthless against rookies, and they were going to test you until you prove you can do it. The one advantage this team could have defensively opposed to last year. I like their defensive line with John Franklin Myers and Malcolm Roach. Mm-hmm. They're bigger. They're beefier because they were terrible against the run. I, I said this like, I mean, they just could not stop the run mm. last year. Even during that five-game win streak, they were giving up like 125 a game. And so with Zach Allen, DJ Jones, mm-hmm. John Franklin Myers, and Malcolm Roach, mm-hmm. and Jackson, the kid from Air Force, yeah. I think they have a chance to be much improved against the run. Because if this team's going to have an identity, yeah, I know Peyton's preference, Sean Payton, would be they have a physical identity that can win at the line of scrimmage. Yeah, one of, the, one, of the reasons, one of the reasons. One of the reasons Sertan doesn't have a gaudy amount of interceptions isn't his ability. Nobody's questioning that. It's the opportunity. And yeah. <laughs> third and two, what are you doing? Well, we're not yeah. throwing it at Pat Sertan. Well, and it's a double screen or a short. Yeah, it's nothing. Sure. You can sure. And and if you really just want to. I do deny the cliche he takes away half the field. Not really. It's it's third and four. You put DK Matt Metcalf out wide, run him outside. That's not half the field, Troy. That's like six yards on the sideline. You know, it gives you a lot of room over the middle of the field in different places as well. So I don't know, man. It's 
I'm glad they have Sertan. You need good players. You need great players. And he clearly is one. The 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 issue is you're only so effective. I did do I did my own little research, Troy. Oh, okay. And, wow. Wait, stop. Wait. Can we go to a break here? Yeah, right. Exactly. Need to get some water. Need... <laughs> Out of the highest paid positions, where do you think cornerback ranks? I was listening to your show the other day, so I know the answer to this. Seventh. It's sixth, not seventh. Sixth. Well, just you listen like most people, barely. But I appreciate it. Any well, anything you were, I can get. You, you had made that segment so confusing where you went back and forth with Tyler and you're both working off two different lists. I thought it ended up at sixth. I'm like, you guys need a graphic for this. Uh, you're probably right. But it was, so yeah, sixth. Okay. So it's it's quarterback. This yep. is interesting. Receiver. And quarterback was Joe Burrow at $62.1 million. And this is just like this year, average salary, not guaranteed money. It's because yeah, right. this flexes things out. I'm just going highest paid dude at his position this year. Joe Burrow, 62 point whatever million dollars. Justin Jefferson, receiver second at $35 million. Then you go to pass rusher Bosa, which I think is like 37. Chris Jones, defensive tackle at about um, 35. And then Penny Sewell, um, offensive lineman, 30 million. Okay, so the difference between second and fifth, Troy, is like $5 million. It's relatively close. Nowhere close to quarterback. Then you go to corner and Sertan's 24. So it's a dramatic drop off between the fifth highest paid position and the sixth, whereas two through five are, you know, it's relatively scooched in. But it's significantly different from corner to wide receiver, never mind quarterback. And I think the NFL is paying for the current value, Troy. So I'm not debating whether or not Sertan is incredible. I'm not. But you're going big bucks to the sixth relative value position in the league. You, I think we all just got to keep that in mind. However, you can get away with it, Troy. You can get away with it if you're underpaying Your for the quarterback. You just hope that quarterback will have a future value 50 to 60 million dollars right and at some point they're going to have to pay a receiver and you and you, you bring up a that's great right point. nfl cyclical you know a few years ago it was you were paying quarterback edge rusher corner tackle I mean, corner without looking i'm guessing was probably third it was definitely ahead of defensive tackle then all of a sudden people started we need to win in the middle of the field right and that defensive tackle position has grown in value significantly even the de- interior offensive linemen are getting paid an insane amount of money, but it's cyclical. But at some point in this off season, don't we think they're going to have to spend that 25, 30 million on a receiver? I mean, they're going to have to go get a playmaker with all my trust. I, and I actually believe in Sean Payton as an offensive play caller. And it, it, I'm not saying he's a genius, but his history is his history. And I know if, if Drew Brees made him, well, he helped make Drew Brees. Drew Brees wasn't going to the hall of fame when he got to new Orleans. We all watched him with the chargers. He was a nice quarterback. Yeah. He was nobody's idea of a Hall of Famer. But at some point, you need playmakers. He had Michael Thomas for a few years there. He had some, you know, Kamara. Is, I mean, he, you need one of those guys or an X-Factor guy. And you mentioned Travis Hunter. If they Let's say they draft him. I still say they're going to have to pay for another playmaker. Agreed. Whether that's it. I don't want to overpay for running back, but whether that's a true tight end, whether they're going to have to get a legitimate playmaker, whether you draft one and it's Hunter or another receiver. You still don't you have to spend money, DMAC, on a play? No game? doubt about it. And listen, they gave Cortland Sutton some, um, you know, walking around money as a little, hey, how you doing? Thanks a lot. Right. That wasn't money to guarantee him here for the rest of the year. In fact, I thought you could feel it from Cortland Sutton this week as he was talking about the Pat Sertan haters. And I'm like, who are the Pat Sertan haters? Patrick Sertan is like highly regarded by everybody. And it felt like, Cortland may have been projecting a little bit, Troy. Oh, and that's what I wonder. I was like, he's talking about all these guys. That, that, you know, if you don't have him one, you don't know. You're, I mean, I was just like, okay. I mean, most people have him three or two. Like, right. what kind of disrespect are we talking about here, man? I mean, every NFL regards him as either the top corner or top three. Like, it's not yeah. a debate. And he was like so personal. It is funny you said that because I was wondering, like, is he talking about himself here? Because he felt it felt so personal all of a sudden. I think he clearly was projecting on himself because <laughs> who 
who is down on Patrick Sertan? He is literally widely regarded as the best corner in the league. He's paid like it. He's the only Broncos player on any list whatsoever. He's a team like nobody is talking. That was Cortland talking about Cortland, Troy. Like, let's keep it real. And, you know, I get his frustration because, you know, he's been here for a long time uh, and he's not being paid like. How about this one? I'll give you another research, Troy. Crazy. There are 12, 12 wide receivers making more per year than Patrick Sertan. 12. Yeah, that's crazy. Bananas. And it was like six this offseason or seven probably. It's and Waddle and Brown and uh, St. Brown. Um, Here's the Jeff good news, though. Here's the good news. Here's the good news. These guys do come available in free agency all the yeah. time. All the time. So not only can you draft them, you can pick them up in free agency too. It does happen. The Jaguars did it. You, again, you're going to overpay, but the Jaguars sure. did it. We invented their offense two years ago. I think it was two years ago. Christian Watson was part of that. But, yeah, listen, th there's things we like about what the Broncos are doing, DMAC. Clearly, again, with the coach, the quarterback, the GM, the owner, they all seem on kind of the same page finally. They have stability. Again, I like the Broncos. I just don't like them in this matchup. And I, I want to get a prediction for you. Now, before I let you go, I got to ask you your opinion on the CU Nebraska game, okay. at least in you know, a quick summary. But how do you see this game going? I, I think you mentioned the score earlier, but like I, my score is right around yours. I have it like 23 17. But you see a close game, you see a competitive game, it sounds like. But like, like me, uh, it matters. <laughs> well, you know, I think the spread is six. I'll have the Broncos cover the spread, I guess, if we want to go in that direction. 23 20 Seattle. And I certainly hope I'm wrong. Um, uh, I'll I'll just give them three points because it's a home game. That's it. Other than that, I think it's pretty even, Stephen. And um, I'd be obviously thrilled for the Broncos to actually win. Um, it, it sets up a pretty dramatic home opener against Pittsburgh one way or the other because we don't know what's going on with Russell Wilson right now because of his calf injury. Um, so I, I'll take Seattle for the home field. And because of your um, daunting uh, stats about rookie quarterbacks and starts there. So I'll, I'll, I'll roll with history and the home field, but, but only by a little bit. Yeah. I like you. I, if they win, it's a great story. I root for the story. It'd be a great upset to start the season and then they'll see Pittsburgh and, and hopefully Russell Wilson limp out of the locker room, like Willis Reed for the New York Knicks in the seventies. That's going to have some juice next week's going to have some juice. That's going to be, I, I'm yeah. really yeah. hoping that Russell Wilson starts because that week will have definitely some juice at the stadium. Finally, okay. we'll get to and I'm joined by Darren McKee, DMAC. You know him as on 12 to 3, 92.5 on the PhD show every day, or excuse me, Monday through Friday on altitude. We can't, like, it would be remiss if I didn't ask you. See you, Nebraska. Yeah. We got Dion, and they're a similar dog. I think a seven and a half point dog to Matt Rule. Both these coaches have shown respect this week. There's no insults. You know, the better. Better be dead. I'd rather be dead than red. I mean, I lived that with Coach McCartney. I was covering the team when he started that, when nobody could re wear red, even reporters at practice. Uh, and there just doesn't feel like there's any vitriol this week. What kind of chance to give the Buffs going to uh, Lincoln this week? Can uh, Dion and that crew pull off the upset of the Nebraska Cornhuskers, the hated Nebraska Cornhuskers? Um, sadly, it doesn't look good because the defense doesn't look any better than last year. And the offense is the offense. In fact, I don't know, Troy. To me, that looked like the same exact Buffs team that I saw last year. Incredible offensive weapons, horrible game management, and a leaky defense. And I, I actually don't know what's changed. Uh, I, I, I guess Shadur didn't just get <laughs> hammered and sacked a lot, but he took a lot of hits and still was running around. Um, so the, 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 the impactful, and they have no running game again. So, but they do have, you know, two top 10 NFL draft picks and um, maybe more out there. I mean, they've got a, uh, an incredible offense in terms of throwing the ball, catching the, they have, they have everything the Broncos don't have. Right. Yeah. In terms of, yeah. <laughs> yeah but I mean, um, I got Nebraska winning like 41, 27. Something along those Ooh, lines. 41. Kind of yeah, I, I have it more like yeah, 36 30. I think they'll be in the game. Their inability to run the ball concerns me because you get one dimensional on the road and they can't take the crowd out of it. Dallin yeah. Hayden is an X factor for me. I mean, the okay. kid, I mean, with all due respect to Charlie Offerdahl, I, I love the mm. story. I do, 
But when I watch him, I see a kid that looks like he's playing on Fridays. When I watch Hayden, he's a kid who could play on Sunday. Like, you've got to play this Hayden kid. He was at Ohio State. He had like 300-yard games at Ohio State. At some point, you got to commit to the run a little bit to give yourself a chance. The one glimmer of hope defensively is Robert Livingston, unlike uh, the guy last year. They mm -hmm. did, I don't think they made one halftime adjustment last year defensively. True. And I'm not even Good point. Yeah. They made a huge halftime adjustment in how they stopped the run in the third quarter last week. They played. They only gave up like 62 yards in the third quarter against North Dakota State, and I, and I get it. It's context. It's North Dakota State. Last year, they made no halftime adjustments ever. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe there's something there, but – Again, I'm with you. I watched that team. I'm like, damn, did 2023 end? It looks like the same team. Two of the best players in college football, but they're so, I mean, they're like Dolly Parton. They're top heavy. I mean, what are we doing? <laughs> I don't know. And and the like undisciplined nature of like Shiloh Sanders. Who yeah, that's got to stop. That's got to stop. He could have had three flags thrown on him, not just one. And, and guess what? First drive, he could have. And guess who I saw being really critical of Shiloh? His brother, Bucky. Yeah. Dion Jr. was on with Mac McChesney on a podcast ripping Shiloh. That's not me saying it. That's his brother, okay? Well, I'm glad. some Yeah, because his brother played defensive back, I think, at SMU. Like, enough. <laughs> like, I get you're a physical player, and he hunts for the big hit all the time. But he, he gets, like, 20 tackles because their linebackers don't scare anybody. But you cannot – I get play to the whistle. Totally understand. You can't play beyond the whistle in the way he does it because when you cheap shot guys as a safety, it's for the whole world to see. Yeah, because it's in space. Like you, they're not good enough to overcome the, his mistake and Shador throwing and not stopping the clock there. Those two mistakes by the two coaches' sons. Like guys, what are we doing? Like, well, you need and, to be and the smartest the, players on the field. Uh, no doubt about it. And the and listen, I understand that Shermer and 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 Prime were really upset with Shador. There's zero chance they told him to do that or called for it. But he's at the minus 42, and he's 55 yards away for throwing for 500 yards. Okay, he's trying to help his buddy out. Uh-huh, right. Yeah, I'm not buying – I am not. Buy, I think he saw a single coverage with no safety help, and he knew that 500 yards was one pass away. Well, and he said it was disrespectful, and I'm like – they're loading the box to stop right. the run because you're going to absorb the clock. It's right. not disrespectful. It's football. It, it's football. It's like, I saw a man covered. Yeah, because they think they're going to run the ball. Because right. if he, you run the ball there, they get the ball back with like eight seconds at their own 10-yard line. That's right. That's right. Listen, and, and this is – 37, 38, This isn't a hard – let Troy, the, it came down to a Hail Mary that was caught at the yeah, four-yard four line. Yards. Yeah, you were four yards away. You were like, you know, an extra uh, bench press set away from that ball being thrown into the end zone. So, I mean, listen, and 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 on that play, you had Travis Hunter screaming at his teammates to knock it down that they completely ignored. Also in that game, Travis Hunter was the only player on defense at one point. The defense couldn't get onto the field. We almost had a snap of North Dakota State literally against Travis Hunter, and that was it. So, uh, listen, I keep being impressed by Travis Hunter. You know, I was going to say, he, he, he walked – I walked away from that seeing him in person live. Like, that's the best player in college football. That's a Reggie Bush-type player who is a dual – he literally plays both ways. I think I walked away thinking he's going to be an NFL receiver. My only concern is can he take the punishment because he's not very big. Well, we'll see. Um, like Devontae Smith, the, the kid from uh, Alabama who won the Heisman yeah. at the Eagles, very similar build. He's even slimmer. Yeah. That gives me hope. But that would be my only issue because Hunter's never played a full season. He's always missed time in college to injury. But God damn, is he good. Yeah, and, and I, really I, think, good. I think you got to give Travis Hunter a shot at being somewhat of a two-way player in the pros as well. Um, hey, man, if he can become the Shohei Otani – of the NFL, I'm here for it. I, I've been incredibly impressed, not only of his abilities, which are, you know, in outer space, but he's obviously a very smart kid with the 4.0 yeah. GPA and just his football sense. Just look at him. Say, he he literally football. knows what's going His football IQ is off the charts. And I'll, I'll tell you why. This is a quirky reason. He plays a lot of video games. He plays a yeah. lot of college football video games. And you can 
rip kids or whoever for playing a lot of video games, but you can learn something if you're watching simulated football over and over and over again. I think there's going to be some positive things. And from all accounts, the kid goes to football practice, plays video games, has a fiance, and that's it. And what a what a great role model, period. So again, if, if, if I'm talking about positives, Travis Hunter to me is like, um, for the Broncos, like, wow. He's an easy kid to root for. He's a hell of a player, and he's, he shows a sense of maturity that is a little bit different than a lot of the other stars on the team. So um, I'm, I'm just a huge Travis Hunter fan. Yeah, well, we'll end it there. You've been very gracious with your time, d sure. uh, I hope that the, we walk on Monday. We're talking about two of the biggest wins in recent memories for That'd the Bucs and for the Seahawks. History says we'll be lucky to get one just because of the nature of where they're playing, folks. They're very difficult stadiums to win, and rookie quarterbacks have trouble winning. But, man, would it be a heck of a story. DMAC, I can't thank you enough for your okay. time. Again, yeah. listen to DMAC Monday through Friday on Altitude 92.5, noon to 3 on the Ph.D. program. Thanks, my man. You got it, buddy.